All right, welcome everyone to CST 8102. Yeah, that's the right course code. Um, basic introduction to Linux, also known as introduction to operating systems. Uh, essentially the point of this course is to teach you about Unix-like operating systems. Uh, I'll introduce myself first a little bit. My name is Dan Goudreau. Half of you have met me, half of you have not. A percentage of you may have seen my recordings from my CST 8215 on YouTube because um, I also teach the database course when they need me to teach the database course. Actually, I should say the, I teach a Linux course when they need me to teach a Linux course. It's the other way around. Um, I am a college graduate, like you guys aspire to be. I'm not a university guy. I graduated from college 23 years ago, almost now. Um, and a program fairly similar to CP, except mine was three years instead of two because I had to take business courses as well, because that's just how it was done back then. So, um, After 20 some odd years working for various companies, including uh, Digital Compact and HP, um, I am now working for a company called Cadlink Technology. It's a company here in Ottawa. I've been with them for 18 years, minus a two year break. Um, what do I do for a living? I am a full stack web developer. So what does that mean? I, I do everything from setting up the web server all the way to designing UI. Uh, my UI sucks. I'll admit it now. I'm not a UI guy. I can implement UI. That's why we get the, the UI person to make UI that kind of looks pretty. And then I make it happen. Um, I am not a Linux specialist. I will admit it right up front to you guys. I know my way around it fairly well. I've been using it for, you know, 18 some odd years. Uh, but most of my usage has been setting up as web servers and that kind of stuff. So there's a few commands in here that I, when I teach this course that I tend to stumble along on because I don't use them on a regular basis. If you don't use it every day, it gets rusty. I'll admit it now. So I'm warning you guys, I may make a few mistakes and I will correct myself. And I have been called out by students that actually remember those commands better than me. And that's okay. Um, I'm fairly easygoing. Um, I put up with a lot of crap, within reason. Um, however, one thing I will not put up with is playing games in class. And actually, some of the slides will actually cover some of these, one of these topics on the way by, but as some of you have noticed, I've got a microphone on and there's a camera pointed at me. I record my lectures. What do you think it sounds like on the recordings when somebody's trying to get their APM to world record levels? All you hear is a constant noise in the background, which adds hours of me to processing to something I do for free. Because I don't get paid to do the post-processing on the recording. So, that being said, please be respectful for everybody else, otherwise I'll just stop recording my lectures. Which brings me to my policies in general about recording my lectures. I record them for two reasons. Three reasons. One, I don't need to do review. Why? It's all there. Two, if you're sick, don't make the rest of us sick. Go home. Stay in your bed. The video is usually up within 24 hours. Just saying. I, if you're sick, don't come in and make the rest of us sick. Uh, reason number three is very similar to reason number two. Life happens. If you get hurt or, you know, your employer suddenly threatens to fire you if you don't show up for work, on this one day, not the whole term, just that one day, that's okay. Um, which means, which leads me to the last point is I don't take attendance. I'm one of the freak teachers that never takes attendance. Um, the only time attendance is mandatory or it will be mandatory is two points through this term. Point number one, the midterm. Why? Because you're going to be sitting in here to do it. If you're not here and you don't sign the attendance sheet and I see you submitted a grade, your grade goes from whatever you got to zero. Because I assumed you're sitting outside somewhere with a couple of friends helping each other. And the written exam, which is during the week, it's the last second last week of April. So that's the two times I've required to see you in person. Obviously the advantage is coming to see me in person because you can ask questions. And I can clarify if you don't understand something. Ditto for the labs. The labs are Basically put you come, you do the work, or you don't come and you do the work and you submit it online. It's fantastic. I don't care which way you do it. 
Uh, we're all technically adults in here, although some of us may not act like adults all the time, or so I've been told uh, by my teenage daughter that I don't act like an adult very often. You know, whatever. She's 18. Apparently she's an adult. And she's trying to tell me what that means. But that's okay. So, enough about me. I'm going to get into the material for the first lecture. Um, the good news is actually there's one timeline thing. Yes, I haven't given you guys your CSI yet. I'm aware. Myself and the other profs are just negotiating when the midterm was going to happen. So it's hard to write a CSI when you don't know that important date. Uh, so just so you know now, the midterm is happening the week before reading week. The good news is for you guys means for reading week, there is going to be no 8102 work at all. By then you should have all the labs done that belong before the reading week. The exam will be done. And if there's any hybrids that you feel like doing, you can, but technically you'll have no work for me during that week. Yay. Which means I should be able to sit at home and you know play video games in my basement for an entire week without getting an email from a student. All right. And this isn't my uh, slides. I inherited somebody else's slides, and this guy likes animated slides. So in this term, you will learn about Linux. Basic commands, folder structure. You're going to be using virtual machines. Uh, you already installed virtual machines last term. Uh, if you don't have a virtual machine installed, it's going to be a rough term for you. There, if you're trying to run Linux on your, right on your machine, you may have an interesting time about halfway through the term. Just putting it there, out there. Um, you're going to learn how to use VI. That's actually one of the hybrids. VI is the shit. It's not shit. It's the shit. Just specifying that there is actually, you know, a word in there. Um, the VI is probably the most powerful text editor you ever will ever use. It's also the most cryptic text editor you will ever use. My second job out of college, 23 years ago, we used VI as our text editor. The commands are the same. It's, the, it's one of the oldest editors out there, and they actually made VI, they make VI plugins for pretty much every major IDE because its command structure is so fantastic, where you can do everything with keystrokes to jump around a, a file. You're gonna learn about using shells, because unlike Windows, Linux comes with tons of different ways of doing things. Uh, you're going to learn specifically the shell called Bash and how to write scripts for it. Um, if you learn Batch files and Computer Essentials, uh, imagine Batch files on steroids with a syntax that looks like Lisp. If you don't know what that is, feel free to go look. You're going to cry. Because it's the most anal and retentive language you'll ever see. Okay. Now, there's two texts that are recommended but not required, so hopefully you haven't been charged for them. Check your receipts. When they're, they're recommended, you're not supposed to get charged. The first one, just skip it. Don't even bother. Download it unless you want to find something to sleep on. The second one, on the other hand, is pretty decent. It's you know a quick reference guide to help you through some of the commands if you actually like a paper book. I haven't opened a paper book in 10 years. My book is called uh, Google and DuckDuckGo. Between those two, I usually find everything because it always ends up in Stack Overflow somewhere. Uh, it is available through the digital resources portal. The problem is once you get one, you get both and you get charged for both. The first one's expensive. Uh, if you know where to go, you know where to get it. <coughs> Yar. Um, classroom time is for class. Lab time is for labs. You know, whatever. This is somebody else's line, but it actually applies also. Um, yeah, you shouldn't be doing other stuff during the lecture, honestly. I, if you come to the lab and you play games, I really don't care. But just try to be uh, reasonable for the people around you. Like last time, I had a group of four guys that kept playing Overwatch in one of my labs, and they were really actually loud and obnoxious. So I got tired of it, and I booted them out. You know. It's actually it's the same guys that used to come to my lecture to play Overwatch while sitting in the front row. They had a pair of brass ones, if you know what I mean. Uh, until I told them if I saw them in my class again, I'd get them expelled, which I can't do, but it was a really good line. 
Uh, and they took me seriously, and I never saw them again for that's the term. Instead of not playing their games, were more important than listening to the lectures. Okay, life happens. Feel free to have your cell phones in class. Mute it or put it on silent or whatever. Um, mine's been muted, I think. Actually, let me check. I'll be a good citizen. Oops. There we go. Now it's muted. Um, if your phone rings because you know some, then you recognize the number of oh crap things are bad. Just walk out the door. No food or drink. I don't care if you drink. If you bring donuts, bring enough for everyone. Uh, same thing for pizza. The only rule is, is if you bring food or drink, if it smells, then I'm going to ask you to leave. What time is this class? Five o'clock. What time is supper usually? Sometime between five and seven for some people, not students. Sometime between five and seven for the average Canadian. A lot of us are going to get hungry if you smell pizza or poutine or whatever. If you come in with a sandwich, that's fine. Don't come in with fish. That's nasty. Um, same thing with food and drink. I mean, drink whatever you want. I don't care. I'm a coffee fiend. So that's not going to bug me. Okay. This is a 212 course. And two hours of theory, one hour of hybrid, two hours of lab a week. And then homework time, whatever the heck that's supposed to be, because you can do all the work in lab. Except for the hybrids, and even then I've seen people plow through a couple of labs and then sit there and do a bunch of hybrids while they're in lab so they don't have to do any at work. It's not a heavy-duty course load-wise compared to some of the other courses you may have had. <coughs> Java? Or uh, maybe database, depending who your database prof was. But considering Kumari was running half of my assignments, they shouldn't have been too, or my, and my labs, it shouldn't have been too bad. So depending how they went about it. Okay, uh, don't pay attention to that. I already said I wasn't. I'm just using a standard set of slides, right? So um, you essentially, there's two sets of labs you need to show me. Um, the first one, technically, you're supposed to show me that you have your stuff installed properly. Technically, it's doing a screenshot. So that's demonstrated. It's the last set of labs, 7, 8, and 9. I mean, no, sorry, 8, 9, and 10 are the ones where you got to show to me that they actually work. Um, because often what happens is one person figures it out, then they copy it for everybody else, and then they all submit it. But since it's code, it all looks the same. They just change the comments at the top of their student number. So I want you to demonstrate, and if it doesn't work, you have to explain to me why it doesn't work. And when I got four guys telling me the same thing, you know, it gets a little weird. All right, the midterm is 30%. So you got a big test in the middle, that's 30%. The final exam is 30%. Unlike some of the other courses where the final exams are actually worth more, this one's worth a little less. Uh, labs are 30% and online assignments, all known as, also known as hybrids, are 10%. So you have one test, one exam, that's worth 60% of your grade. The rest of it is to get yourself a good grade. Just putting it out there. Um, you must be able to pass the theory and the labs separately. In other words, you can't pass... Let's say you do the midterm and you write the final exam and manage it, you know, a 55%, but you didn't do a single lab, you still fail. Because you must be able to prove you can do the work. Um, in other words, you have to have at least 50% in both components combined. It shouldn't be too hard because, you know, first lab is done for half of you and that's worth 10% of your lab grade. Okay, where do I get help? Feel free to email me. Um, those of you that have had, may have known of me, may not have heard, I tend to be really fast on my email answering. Uh, why? Guys, I have a cell phone. Um, you can try your academic advisor, your program coordinator. Uh, your mileage may vary. Once you go past me, why? I've heard stories about how coordinators are hard to reach and I've never heard of someone actually get a hold of their advisor. So, 
but maybe things have gotten better. Uh, there's also student success specialists. Those guys are actually fairly easy to get a hold of because that's their entire job is to talk to students. Um, however, the most important thing is, is you have to realize you need help. So you realize that things aren't going well and you're falling behind on your work. Don't wait till a, wait till a week before the exam to say, Dan, I didn't do any labs since like the second week. I'm like, ha, 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 ha. Uh, give me a good excuse. Be good to sell it. Because I've heard every excuse. And I've heard some doozies over the years. Um, but I will, but if you do approach me early on and as soon as you realize you've got problems, I will gladly help. As you notice, I'm a little sarcastic. But it doesn't mean I don't care, it just means I'm sarcastic. Okay, we're skipping Brightspace because it sucks. Um, Well, I can't say that. That's not quite true. Um, it's got its perks. I'll uh, I'll go through where things are in Brightspace. Um, actually, I should just do it now. I don't want to. But I'll do a quick one. The problem is that the guys who had me already have already seen parts of it, so... Okay, by now you guys know what Brightspace looks like. The basically, um, as I said, I don't have a CSI set up yet, but you literally have every single week broken down, week by week for the entire term. Uh, in here includes all the slideshows, all the labs, all the additional reading you may want to do. The hybrids are all set up in here too. Um, my contact information is here. I actually show you guys where I am and wh what time I'm there. Uh, why? So that if you can't come to your normally scheduled lab, you can go to another lab. I ask, please don't do that for the first two weeks because the first two weeks, the labs are always pretty darn full. And after the first two weeks and people settle in and go, ah, oh, Dan doesn't really care. Then my labs become really empty really fast. And then there's room for people to start mix matching between labs. I don't care if what lab you come to because I, I treat all the lab sections as a single course. It's just I have specific times I'm available to help. Um, in the course document, uh, there is an old version of the CSI. I have to update that one. That's the old profs CSI. Holy crap, the font's small. Um, the course outline is there, so that's our contract. The hybrids are here. Then you got all the weeks, and under each week, you'll see lab and the documents and what you need to do. Uh, labs two, three, four, five, six are quizzes. So two through six are quizzes. Essentially what you do is there's a set of instructions. You do what the instructions tell you. And then you record the output, you record the commands you did, and then you're going to literally going to copy paste them into the quiz and then you hit submit. Um, this serves two purposes. You get one, right away you find out how close you were to the right thing. Boom, instant grade. Um, it's not perfect. I'm warning you now. Uh, it's not perfect, but, it, but the item number two is it makes sure that everybody's stuff is submitted in the same format. When I receive open office documents or LibreOffice documents, and then I try to open them in Word, and Word says, what the hell is this? Or I get, you know, a 55 meg file, a 55 meg Word document that's all screenshots. No, makes it really hard to grade. So these are quizzes, and once you start doing them, you'll, you'll see what it's like. Quiz two is the first one you'll get like that. Um, there's reading week. And then there's a couple of uh, pre-made quiz, uh, practice quizzes in here and stuff too. As you explore through the Brightspace stuff, you'll see where it all is. Okay, onwards to tonight's lecture. Uh, this lecture is to make sure you can actually start doing lab two, which is next week. Um, okay, skip that because I've already given that to you. We are, why am I have two copies of this? Okay, let's start right from the top. What is Linux? Now, 
some of you have played with Linux. Some people are actually trying to prove themselves they can actually function on Linux all the time. Um, entirely doable, depending what you do for a living. Uh, Linux is a Unix-like operating system. Unix has been around for a long, long, long time. And it has a certain set of standard commands. And a lot of operating systems mimic it. Um, but currently, Linux is a really popular operating system for open source development because you don't have to pay for licensing. Uh, some of you may have heard something called the Microsoft tax. You buy a computer, you automatically pay an extra $100 on it because Windows is on it. Um, you know, the Microsoft tax. The operating system is completely open source. That means you can download the source code for the OS, make changes to it, and recompile it and make it do whatever you want it to do. Uh, once you understand how to code up an operating system, that is. Um, but that means it's completely free for everyone. It was designed by a guy called Linus Torvalds. Probably not pronouncing his last name right. Uh, he was 21 years old in Helsinki at the time. And in the early 90s, he decided, I'm going to do, create myself an OS just for shits and giggles. Because he wasn't happy with the current state of the OSs. And what was the current state of the OSs? Well, you had the choice of Unix and Windows 3.1. Now, those of us that are past a certain um, seasoning, remember Windows 3.1 clearly. It's what I used all the way through college. So I literally remember downloading Linux 1.0 when I was in my third year of college. So it's been around for a bit. And he decided to come up with something that's Unix-like uh, because Unix was a powerful operating system. And he wanted to make it PC compatible because most Unixes were not. And he wanted to make sure it was free. Those were his two goals. So he wanted a free operating system that ran on Intel compatible hardware. And that was it. <laughs> Linux is taking the internet by storm. The PC world, nah, it depends on how much of a zealot you are. Um, but the world of the internet is pretty much running on Linux. Um, web servers, 90% of the web servers out there are running Linux and or Unix. Take your pick, one or the other. How many Mac users in here? I know there's at least one because I had somebody come up with a Mac at some point in the lab. Anyways, Mac is not running on Linux. Mac is running on Unix. How many people here have an Android phone? Yay. No walled gardens for you. That's running on Android. Android is Linux. You literally, when you look at certain parts of the uh, information about your phone, you, you actually get kernel numbers, and they actually match up to Linux kernel numbers. Android is Linux, just so you know. Uh, most networking switches are running Linux. Um, a lot of attached devices around your house are running Linux. For example, uh, Google Home or Alexa, they're running Linux. There's actually some cars out there that run Linux. Yeesh. I don't know if I want to drive around on one of those, but they I do exist. Um, the problem, the thing is, is that it's actually really powerful and it's really good for what it does. To this day, Linus is still in charge of the Linux kernel. He actually stepped back a few years ago to let people do it. Then he decided everybody's making a mess of it and he came back in, called everybody idiots. And if you ever look up anything about Linus, you'll know he's very caustic with how he words his phrases. Um, he's been known to call people effing idiots, amongst other things. Um, the rest of the operating system, on the other hand, is written by other people. So he manages the kernel. The kernel is what basically turns on, boots the computer, and allows other software to talk to the hardware. Um, Windows has a kernel. And pretty much every other operating system has a kernel of some sort. So as other companies collect up bits and pieces of the software that runs on Linux, they all put in their own little flavor and they end up being called distributions. For this course, we're using one called Ubuntu. And uh, the company that puts it together is called Canonical. God, I hope I pronounced that right. And the funny thing is, is Ubuntu is spun off from another distribution called Debian. There's a distribution based on Ubuntu called Mint. There's also Fedora, which is a derivative of Red Hat. 
There's CentOS, which is a ripoff of Red Hat. There's, well, I don't know, hundreds of distributions. Each have their own little niche. Each have their little job. Um, but for all intents and purposes, there's four big ones, and everybody else is niche. Uh, the four big ones are Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat, and um, Debian. There we go. Took me a second to come up with the fourth. Uh, originally was designed for Intel compatible hardware, also known as a 3D6 or 4D6. Uh, probably most of you in here don't know what those are unless you're past a certain age. When I started college, I had a 3D6. It cost $3,000. I think my mouse has more horsepower than my first PC. Not quite, but pretty darn close. Um, but now, Linux runs on everything. There is not a single CPU architecture out there that does not run Linux. It runs on your phones. It runs on Macs, if you want to make it run on a Mac. Um, Alpha processors, which are pretty much a dead processor, but they were real fantastic stuff at one point. Um, Spark, which has been bought by Oracle and killed, because that's what Oracle does. Um, and tons and tons of other hardware. Um, it would actually run on the original Macintosh computers. Remember the Mac OS 9, the little boxes? You could actually get Linux to boot on those if you wanted to. Uh, I wish I could be kidding when I say it'll probably it can run on your fridge, but there are actually are versions of fridges with Linux on them. The ones with the touch screens. Okay, so Linux has a mascot. I don't know what it is about open source, but they like having mascots for everything. And it's a penguin called Tux. Tux is chubby. It started with version 0 0.01, released in 1991. Version 1.0 came out in 1994. Like I said, I downloaded it my third year of college because that's the first time I actually had access to the internet. And it was a 256K connection shared by the entire school. So it was screaming fast. Uh, it took seven days to download it. And 22 floppies to install it. And it, uh, there were six of us downloading and making copies of the floppies so we could all try it. And what happened the very first time I put the floppy in my first computer, I wiped it by accident because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it's currently released under the GPL, the GNU Public License, which means the source code is available for everyone. You are allowed to do whatever you want with it. Uh, you can charge for it. You can choose not to charge for it. Um, there's a whole pile of rules of how GPL works. Um, if you really want to know, there's a link in the slides that slides on Brightspace. Um, yeah. So the latest stable kernel, which is actually probably wrong by now, is 4.18.7. There's also a link to show you where all the kernels are. They release a stable kernel every few months. But the magic trick is, if you want to know if you're running a stable or an unstable kernel, the second set of digits, if it's even, it's stable. If it's an odd number, like if it's 417, then it's an unstable kernel. That's just how they do their numbering. All right. Now, Linux distributions. It's packaged for different uses as distribution, depending on what you need. Uh, they tweak the kernels based on various requirements. Um, essentially, the PlayStation 3 was running Linux. You could actually install Linux on it and run real Linux on top instead of the specialized Sony edition. Um, not sure what the PS4 is running, but, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, so there's distributions that serve pretty much every purpose out there. There's uh, pretty much every firewall now is running Linux in some form or other. Uh, odds are your router at home is running Linux. I know my Bell router is running Linux uh, because I figured out how to open up a port and ask it what it was. And it is running Linux. So if you've got a Bell Home 2000, congratulations, you're running Linux. Um, different companies do different things depending on what you need. 
Um, you have everything from full-on desktop operating systems. For like example, the, a copy of Ubuntu you guys have installed. Whether you're running 16, 18, 14, 12, whatever you want. Um, those are pretty much Windows replacements. Unless you want to play games, it would do 95% of what you need except for playing games. And even that, you can still get some games to run on it if you're willing to, you know, get your hair to go gray while you experiment and tweak with files and, you know, fight with it. It's entirely doable. Although, on the other hand, Steam is working hard on actually making stuff to work across all of them. So, eventually, there's a possibility you'll actually have a proper gaming experience. Most versions of Linux are free to download. Uh, Fedora, OpenSussy, Debian, Slackware, Ubuntu, Arch, etc., etc., etc. I could keep going. There's hundreds. Uh, there are some that are not free. Um, Red Hat is not free. Red Hat Enterprise, I should say, is not free. It's a commercial operating system. Uh, Sussy, that is not the open edition, is not free to download. Because there's an open Sussy and there's a not open Sussy. Uh, Novell owns Sussy, just so you know. Though if, if you don't know what Novell is, they used to be the king of the network back in the day. When I went through school, instead of getting a Microsoft certification, we all worked on getting, or a Cisco certification, we all worked getting on Novell certifications. And then five years later, they were all useless. Success. Um, there are free, there are not free. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, the free ones probably do the job just fine for what you need. To install Linux, you choose a distribution. There are hundreds of them. If you really want to know all the distributions, there's a list on the link. And you basically shove a disk in, shove a flash drive in, and they're done. You've got an operating system. Um, depending on your computer, some of the modern computers aren't so fond of Linux. Um, if you have a machine like mine, which has uh, secured computing turned on and secured boot sector and UEFI and all that security crap turned on, you're going to have a good time trying to get Linux to work on it unless you turn it all off. If you turn it all off, then Windows stops working. Pick your poison. Uh, but the cool thing is about the distributions, they're all pretty much the same software. Um, the, what's hiding under the skin, it's all the same for the most part. Uh, what you get from one distribution to the other is a choice of pre-installed software. So imagine if you installed Windows and it came with, I don't know, a web browser. Oh, wait, it does. And an Office Suite. Wait, it does that too now. Uh, but, you know, there once was a time where you installed Windows and you got nothing. And then you installed Linux and you had, oh, look, I got a web browser, I got an Office Suite, I can listen to music without having to download anything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What you get between the distributions is a different window dressing on the same thing. Um, so depending on how, what the distribution does, there's some of it is how it's managed. They have different what's called package managers. Ubuntu and the Debian family use apt. The Red Hat family use something called RP, uh, yum. Sorry, they're the RPMs, but they use something called yum. They do the same job. They allow you to install packages. For those of you that have done Lab 1, have discovered apt already. apt install vim, apt install open whatever tools. That's package manager. It lets you install software. For those of you that are used to playing in Windows land, that's like the Windows Store. For the Mac users, it's like the whatever the heck it is, the Mac Store, I guess. Let's call it the Mac Store, because I guess that's what it is. The Apple Store, sorry. You go in, you install stuff. With Linux, you do it from the command line. Uh, Ubuntu actually has a graphical UI, like a store also. So you know, it's getting to the point where it's getting pretty much all the same. All right. The main differences between distributions are optimizations to the kernel. So the cool part is about Linux, depending on who creates a distribution, they tweak it so it runs better for certain jobs. So for example, on a phone, you don't want to run the same kernel that would be on a web server. Why? Because your phone would barely be usable. You would not also want to use the kernel that you have on a for desktop because it's designed for a machine with 16, 32 gigs of RAM, 
with you know full sets of processors, not the special little reduced instruction set jobs that are in phones. The kernels are tweaked for the job. If you get a, a distribution designed for networking, the kernel will not be tweaked for audio and video. It'll be tweaked for throughput, for letting files and data through real fast. That's their purpose. It'll dis the different distribution will also decide what's included by default. For example, if you go and install base Debian, it'll look nothing like Ubuntu. It'll look nothing like Mint. It'll look nothing like insert other distribution here because they all decide, well, for this distribution, I want to have these packages installed available right off the bat, and people can add on their own as they want. It's entirely possible to install Ubuntu and make it look like Fedora. Probably take you a couple of hours to make it happen. But it's entirely doable, I just don't know why you'd want to do it. Um, but you can. Uh, the interface for installing stuff changes, the command line, some of the GUI stuff is different. Uh, the administration tool is different. Ubuntu has done a really good job of hiding everything. Uh, they're taking a page from Apple. Um, in other words, you want to change the settings on your computer, you've got to use these weird control panel stuff that looks a lot like the Apple control panel. Um, but you can still drop the command line and do it all by hand if you want to. Other, other distributions don't even give you those tools. You still have to do everything by hand. So it's up to you. All right, now we're going to get to the not so fuzzy stuff. Linux is multi-user. Now, a lot of you are going to say, well, hang on, Windows is multi-user. Yet, yeah, no. It is, yes, as in you can have multiple user accounts. Have you ever tried having two people using the same computer at the same time? Literally, the same time. You know, you're logged in and they're logged in too, but you're all using the same computer? That's not something that happens. Linux, on the other hand, is uh, multi-user. As in, if you set up a server, you can have people log into it remotely and actually log in and actually run their software concurrently. So that they have their own desktop, you have your own desktop, or they have their own shell, they have their own shell. And that's just what Unix has always been and that's what Linux does. It's multi-user. It's great, as in you can use the hardware to its absolute maximum by letting multiple people use it at the same time. But if you got a guy who's hogging the system, then everybody suffers too, so, it, you know. Uh, it's multi-process and multitasking. Now, Windows is pretty much there nowadays. I mean, back in the window when this, when Linux was originally written, uh, Windows was not, they, they said it was a multi-operating, you know, multi-processing operating system. It was not. It was what they called preemptive. No, cooperative multitasking, as in a program ran, and then you alt-tabbed away from the program, and the program would stop running and let another program run. But that's not really how it worked. Have we ever, we've all had that clingy friend, right? When you're sitting there and you go, hey, I'm going to help you out with your homework for a little while, and then you get somebody else like, hey, can you give me a hand? I said, I just spent an hour with you, so I'll go give them five minutes and they follow you because they, don't, they still want your attention. That's what the original Windows was like. Linux, on the other hand, was every, cur every process runs inside its own little thing, and they tend to not bang on each other's toes too much. Uh, they can run at the same time. They share the process. And now that we have computers with multiple cores and multiple threads per core, it actually is successful at doing that, where it gives each process its own space in the CPU and they all run without even knowing the other ones are there. Uh, it's also a multiprocessor. Um, Windows does it too, uh, but you have to pay for a really expensive license to do it. Uh, now they have a Windows 10 Pro workstation or a Windows 10 Home Advanced. Um, you can actually have computers with more than one processor. It's not the same thing as more than one core. I can guarantee it's not a single one of you in here with a computer with more than one CPU in it, unless you got them at home and I haven't seen it yet. Um, at work, where I work, we're a software development firm and we have one computer in the building that's got more than one processor. It costs like 16 grand. 
So they're expensive, they're flaky, uh, but Linux handles them really, really well. Um, when you think about uh, a lot of the supercomputers out there are now built with Linux. So you've got a computer with a thousand CPUs in it and it's running Linux. It's a specialized version of Linux, but it can do it. Okay, Linux is made up of a few different things. The first one is the kernel. I've spoken about the kernel already. The kernel is the smallest piece of the operating system that can run by itself. What happens is your computer turns on. It detects where the boot partition is. It loads the bootloader from there. The bootloader is a piece of software that its only purpose in life is to initialize the kernel. So essentially, he's like the butler at the door that says, oh, you want to talk to the kernel. There you go. He's over here. And then he's gone. Like he never even existed. The kernel loads up, and then everything else talks to the kernel. Um, the kernel is a universal translator. In other words, every piece of software that wants to talk to the hardware talks to the kernel. The kernel talks to the hardware. The hardware talks to the kernel, and then the kernel gives you the answer from the hardware. If you want to write to the disk, you're going through the kernel. You want to draw some graphics, you're going through the kernel. You want to pull something off the network, it's going through the kernel. The kernel does it all. Or at least the kernel tells the software how to do it. Um, it's a bit like the old, old style operators where you got, you know, click, click, and they'd actually connect the actual phone lines. Pretty much what it does. It has modules. So the kernel load, loads up. It's a really tiny little piece of software. But then there's something called modules. The modules are basically add-ons bolted on. This is where the kernel developers tend to tweak their kernels. So the modules are device drivers. The kernel launches, it starts listing out all the modules. It'll load up the stuff for USB, it'll load stuff for your video card, it'll load stuff for your network card, it'll load stuff for accessing insert other piece of hardware inside your computer. Lots and lots of modules. Uh, the more modules you have, the bigger your kernel, the more memory your kernel takes up. So a lot of people like tweaking their kernel so there's less stuff in it. You can turn off modules if you want. And these modules are either loadable modules, which means they load up after the kernel was this initialized, or they're actually built into the kernel. Into the kernel. Uh, examples of what would be built into the kernel is memory management. The instructions on how to talk to the memory in the computer, that has to be part of the kernel. Uh, instructions on how to talk to the hard drive, that's usually baked into the kernel. Why? Would you, can you imagine if the kernel loaded up and it didn't know how to talk to the rest of the computer? Or even the compatibility for the CPU. Um, even though AMD com CPUs are supposedly compatible with Intel compa CPUs, they actually have stuff in them that the Intel CPUs don't have. Same thing that around the Intel ones have stuff that the AMD CPUs don't have. So there's actually modules made specifically for tuning those, and those are usually baked right into the kernel. Um, daemons. Not demons, daemons. Uh, I don't know why they chose to call them that, but it's been called daemons back in the, since the Unix days in the 60s. Um, daemons are the equivalent to services in Windows. Essentially, they're entire applications and or programs that are loaded up and they run in memory with no interface. They just, they're just running in the background. Um, for example, Postgres. Install it on Windows. If you, cho you can choose to install it without a GUI, right? It just sits there happily running in the background doing stuff. That's a service. On Linux, it's known as a daemon. Daemon service, same thing. They do the same job. Um, I'm sure out there there could be some, RU, uh, some, oh, uh, some operating system architects that would argue with me about the difference between them. But as far as I'm concerned, they're the same thing. It's a, an application that runs in the background that you don't actually, there's no UI for. Uh, normally when the computer starts up, the kernel loads. After the kernel is loaded and all the device drivers are loaded, the next thing it does is it starts loading up daemons. Um, if you could watch Ubuntu boot without the GUI on top, you'd see all these things loading up and it would go, uh, loading Apache 2, okay. Loading MySQL, okay. 
the starting PostgreSQL, okay. These are all daemons that are launching and then it, it goes up. Uh, they're basically for what they call, yeah. Knock yourself out. Just your lab. No problem. And the, like I said, the rest of the lecture should be up by tomorrow. Um, if anybody else needs to run because they have an online course, feel free to run now. Um, so, yeah. And then the last piece of the Linux architecture is applications. Um, applications are literally what you think they are. Office suites, editors, graphics design software, games, web browsers, those are all applications. Um, they all have an app, most of them have an application manager. They're designed to help with installing and removing prepackaged applications. There once was a time Installing software for Linux was really painful. Like when I first started playing with it years and years ago, you'd have, um, lost my train of thought, give me a second. You'd actually download the source code, compile it, and install the software. And if it didn't go right, you had to figure out how it installed everything and go clean it all out and then try again. Uh, it was really, really painful. It's as painful as I'm trying to describe. Imagine you want to install something on Windows, the first thing you have to do is download Visual Studio. Then download all the requirements for Visual Studio. Then download all the requirements for the application you want to compile. Then download the source code of the application. Hit compile. And then copy all the files to the right place. That's what it used to be like. Nowadays, they have package managers, uh, RPM, Yum, uh, Apt. Those are the big ones. Arc Linux has its own. And if you want to install something, you literally go apt, space, install, whatever it's called, and ta-da, it's ready to go. It has, it may, I gotta be careful, not, you can install it on any of them, but it may have a graphical interface. On Ubuntu, you guys are experiencing it, right? It looks sort of like a stupid version of Windows or Mac. Now, nothing is where you expect it to be, where some of the buttons are like Mac and some buttons are like Windows, it's somewhere in between them. It's running on something called X Windows. X Windows is a, uh, a network enabled graphical interface. What does that mean? That means that, for example, uh, at work, our, our servers are running Linux. And we have, we run them as VMs. So it's a bit like Amazon Web Services, but we run them on our own hardware. And I need to administer one of the servers. I can literally connect to the server and then launch a graphical UI and it actually runs on my machine, not on that machine over there. But it's literally as if I was running Windows, but it's running on, it said, let's say I launched Windows here, but it suddenly appears on your computer instead. So Linux allows you to have a remote UI. It's not the same thing as uh, TeamViewer or that kind of stuff. It literally is running on your machine. And every time you click on a button, it asks the server, what am I supposed to do next? So it's detached. When you run it on your machine within your VM or whatever, it's basically a local X Windows. It's actually literally still going through the networking stack, but since it doesn't need to talk over the network, it's pretty quick. Uh, there's tools, utilities, and add-ons. Um, oh, I didn't have a, an extra list on that one. Um, tools, utilities. Tools are like text editors, like VI. Utilities are um, tools you use to like kind of ping stuff on the network or to do routing checks, that kind of stuff. Basically, it puts the same thing as you have in DOS, where you can create files, delete files, create directories, stuff like that. Okay, why would you choose Linux? There's almost no licensing requirements. Since it's all open source, you can download, install on your computer, not have to pay anyone for it. It's free. Um, there's usually no subscription fees. As some of you may be aware, there's now a subscription version of Windows. You can actually download Windows and pay a, a nice low monthly fee to run Windows on your computer. 
uh, guaranteed forced updates, and guaranteed that they know what you're doing. Just like you're doing now, except you're just not paying a monthly fee. So there's no subscription fees. And there are large support groups. There is a huge documentation program. Uh, there's IRC chat rooms. If you don't know what that is, feel free to go discover the IRC channels on the internet. Uh, you'll never be the same again, uh, depending which rabbit hole you go down. Um, there's news groups and local user groups. There are local uh, Linux user groups in Ottawa. If ever you're curious, you can actually go join them up. They have meetups all over the city where you get together and you hash out your ideas and why you have problems and you've got people that know more than you do to help you. Uh, most of them are fairly tolerant of newbies for only so long because they assume you're going to do some legwork and actually learn on your own also. Uh, Linux supports pretty much every major peripheral you can get on a PC. Um, it supports USB, obviously, PCI. And now I'm going to throw out some acronyms most of you have never heard of. AGP. Advanced Graphics Port. That's what we had before PCI Express. PCMCIA, which used to be how you added stuff onto your laptop. You had little cards on the side and you slide these cards into it and it gave you extra stuff like wireless networking on a laptop. It was amazing. First time I saw a PCMCIA wireless card. Um, SCSI. SCSI hard drives. It's a special, it's a, in a serialized set of connectors for connecting hard drives. Uh, you still see those on servers. They're very expensive. Uh, they're usually on RAID controllers. Nowadays, they've been pretty much replaced with something called serial attached drives, SAS drives. Um, essentially, the drives are all daisy chained one behind the other. Um, but it's essentially the same thing. It supports pretty much every major piece of hardware out there. Uh, Linux coexists well with other operating systems. You can set it up to dual boot. You don't need to get rid of the original OS if you want to run it. Um, although, mind you, as I said earlier, it's getting a little harder to do because modern computers are getting a little more secure in what's allowed to run on it. Uh, if you have secured boot enabled or UEFI enabled or the combination of the two put together, uh, you're going to have a fun time trying to get uh, Linux to install without actually having to change settings in your BIOS, which makes Windows stop working. Uh, Linux can read pretty much every other file system out there. Uh, from the old FAT32, back in the Windows 9, 95, 98 days. Uh, NTFS, which is what your computers are running right now. To all the weird uh, file systems you find out there, Unix file systems, all the different Linux file systems, Oracle's file system, all included in there. Um, and many Windows applications, what they call Win32 or Win64, uh, can now actually run under Linux. Um, there's a couple of different products out there, one called Lindos, there's Wine. They make VMware for Linux. So you know how you guys have Linux running inside VMware? You can go the other way around and install Linux on your machine, then run VMware so you can have a Windows emulated. People do it, and it works. And I've once seen a student install Windows, then VMware, then Linux, then VMware inside of Linux. And then they ran Windows inside of Linux inside of Windows. Yeah, click was like click, and you could see the mouse. But it, it, they could do it. It was like the dumbest thing I ever saw. And there's actually someone out there that's actually ran the experiment. How many, how many deep can I go before everything blows up? And the funny thing is, you could keep going until basically the machine ran out of memory. Not the outside OS, the VMs. Because the VMs are only given, you know, 4 gigs of RAM, so the next one inside can't have more than, say, 2 gigs of RAM. So it kept getting smaller and smaller. Um, so there once was a time where I ran Linux on my machine before I had to do stuff like video editing and video recording. That's not Linux's strong point. And whenever I needed to run Windows software, I literally ran VM software and ran Windows inside the VM. So if ever I ever need to open up Office, it ran inside the VM. It worked. All right. Linux has superior networking abilities. That's one of the reasons why people take it. Uh, more direct control of what's happening inside the networking. 
and it was designed for networking right from the start. Now, here's a strange little piece of trivia for you guys. Um, now, I don't know how many of you have noticed how much Windows has changed since Windows 10 has come out, or even Windows 7 to Windows 8, what the big changes were. Uh, Microsoft went and hired a bunch of Linux engineers to rewrite their networking kernel. So the networking inside Windows 10 is almost identical to Linux's networking. Um, and as one of my co-workers, which spends a lot of time dismantling stuff, um, by stuff I mean software, and usually not ours, um, he actually got Windows to not boot once, and it came up with the first line of ISO Linux. So his suspicion is that Windows is now half Linux. Uh, the security system pretty much looks like Linux. There's chunks of the file system now that looks like the Linux file system. The networking stack looks a lot like Linux. So, you know, Linux is starting to get embedded deeply into Windows. And now you can install Linux inside of Windows. There's actually just literally go Windows options and you hit a button and poof, you got Linux inside of Windows. And it's Ubuntu. Um, but, however, there's one thing Linux does really well that Windows doesn't. Run on shitty old hardware. Or just shitty hardware. Like Chromebooks. Sorry. I, I had to pick on you this time. Linux runs on really old hardware. Like really old. Um, at work, I actually still have a, a, a Pentium Pro processor machine. This thing's been running Linux for 16 years. I've updated the version of Linux on it regularly. Until one day where the kernel says I'm not allowed to run on this anymore. But I found another distribution that did it. It's actually running our security system for our doors. And it's running on basically a computer with eight megabytes of RAM. Not eight gigabytes, eight megabytes. You know, my phone takes pictures that are six megabytes every time it takes a picture. Right. The computer's got a 25 megabyte hard drive in it. And it runs. Linux is great because you can strip all the crap off you don't need. So therefore, if you don't need to have all that crap, it'll run on old hardware. If you don't need uh, blazing fast graphics, it'll run on a gold crappy piece of comp hardware. It's fine. It's a great way to repurpose that hardware that you can use to heat your basement. Does the job. Okay, I'm just gonna pull up some more of this. So, when you install Linux, you need certain partitions. And in Computer Essentials, you guys learned about partitions? Please say yes. Sort of, vaguely remember partitions, Computer Essentials. In other words, taking a hard drive, dividing it up in chunks that are isolated from each other. Okay. Linux needs two partitions to run. There's one called slash, also known as the root partition. It's basically the same thing as the C drive for Windows. And a swap partition. In other words, it's a partition whose entire purpose in life is to operate a swap memory. Because it, it's able to run on really crappy old hardware, sometimes you run out of RAM and it swaps out to the disk. Windows does the same thing. There's actually swap files inside Windows. They're just hidden really well. Linux has a partition called swap. It uses that as extra RAM, as in really slow extra RAM, but it's extra RAM. Uh, you can create as many partitions as you want and use them as the different mount points. Uh, boot, user, home. Uh, as you start learning about the Linux file system, these folders will make more sense. Um, but essentially, boot is the boot partition where Linux actually looks on how to boot a kernel. The kernel lives inside the boot, part, the boot folder which you can have in its own partition. Uh, the user folder, which you can have in its own partition, is the same thing as program files, essentially in Windows. And the home folder is the same thing as the users folder. Not confusing at all. Since, you know, there's a users folder on Linux that's for program files and a home folder for users. But it's essentially the same thing as the users folder on your Windows PC. Mac users, I have no idea. I think you guys have a users folder. Um, the file system of Linux is normally ext2, 3, or 4. Uh, most modern ones use ext4, which are not limited to those file systems. However, the boot partition is usually 
one of those three because most kernels can't read the other file systems until it's loaded the appropriate module. So the boot partition, or if you don't have a dedicated boot partition, the main partition will always be ext2, 3, or 4. Uh, they're backwards and sideways compatible with each other. Essentially, an ext4 partition is readable by an ext2 kernel, and an ext2 partition can be read by an ext4 partition. Okay. <coughs> In Linux, you got something called a super user, known as root. And the root is the administrator. So you know when you first install your Windows computer, it asks you for who you are, and it adds an account, and then every time you want to do something, it asks you sure you want to do this. So basically, it's switching you into administrator mode. Windows actually has an administrator user hidden. And you can actually log in as the administrator user if you know how to turn it on. Not that I recommend it, but you can. Uh, in Linux, this user is called root. And the joke is, if you've got root, you've got total control of the system. Unless files are encrypted, you can see everybody's stuff. Nobody can hide from root. And even if your stuff is encrypted, there's root probably has ways of getting it out of there anyways. Um, yeah. So when you log in as root, you have full permissions to the entire operating system. There is not a single file you cannot touch or change. However, if you log in as root, you'd better know what you're doing. Because you can literally log in as root and then nuke the entire file system by accident. Whereas if you log in as another user, you may not have permissions to do that. Therefore, you're protecting yourself from that. It's a bit like how when you try to do something in Windows and it says, you sure you want to do this? Yes, no. You know that nice little UAC dialog that pops up that dims the rest of the screen? Or used to, but now it just pops up as a, you know, need to run this as an administrator. Uh, Linux lets you log in as an administrator and it never asks you if you sure want to do this. It just assumes you know what you're doing. No hand-holding in there. Now, there is a special folder called root, slash root. Not confusing for as opposed to the root folder, which is slash. Under slash, there's a folder called root, so it's the root root. And the root folder is the root user's home folder. Nobody can get into there except for root, because it belongs to root. And if you're in as root, you can create other users, give them permissions, do whatever the heck you want. Um, the command is there's user add, and there's also add user. They do similar jobs. Uh, you can change passwords using passwd. Uh, some of you have probably seen me use user add or add user for those that were not wanting to reinstall Ubuntu and decided to use their existing one where I just created the your user for you and gave them the appropriate permissions to act like they should. And passwd you should have played with or will be playing with. That's how you change your password for root or for any other user while you're at it. All right. The GUI is convenient to use, but many people, especially administrators, prefer using command line. Why? Because the command line does so much more than the GUI does. If the GUI is that nice little paring knife you've got in your drawer at home, the command line's like the Swiss Army knife with like 55 attachments on it. Um, there's tons of stuff you can do from the command line that you cannot do from the GUI. Uh, the command line runs on character-based terminals. Essentially, you know when you guys were doing lab one, those of you who haven't done lab one, you haven't seen this yet, I make you open terminal and you're typing commands in. That's a character-based terminal. That goes back ages. Back in the day, how many of you remember the green screen computers that you'd see around in stores or cash registers? Or you used to walk around Ikea and they had the computers just for the associate, oh, sorry, the co-workers. And they were like these text-based UIs. They've been all around. Okay, fine, some of us are a little older and we remember these a lot clearer than the young guys. Don't have no idea about dumb terminals. But these used to run with serial lines. There was a connector in the back that ran to a computer with a series of cards in it, and each of those were connected and they actually behaved as their own terminal. When you open up a terminal in Ubuntu, you're basically uh, faking a serial connection to a dumb terminal. Which is why it's called terminal, by the way. 
So if you wonder why, in Windows it's called the command prompt. In Linux you call it opening up a terminal because you're emulating a dumb, term, dumb terminal. The old green screen jobs, or they sorry, the amber screen ones, depending on where you worked. If you were lucky, you had the amber ones that didn't burn out your retinas. Um, you know, there's the hardware was there. Uh, command line utilities are usually faster and more powerful than their GUI counterparts. Once you learn the syntax, you can do so much more than command line, so much faster that you wonder why you're using the GUI. Um, for example, you want to add a user in Ubuntu and you want to do it using the GUI. You have to go find the control panel, go to users, then go unlock, type in a password, hit add, type in all the stuff, hit save, or you go to the command line and go user add space whatever the person's called, enter. Done. But it's learning what the commands are that takes the longest. Um, often there's no GUI counterpart. There are tools that there, there is no UI for. Um, the search tools, the finding tools are way more powerful, the command line ones, than they ever will be. Anybody here ever try to find a file inside Windows? Actually try to use the Windows find tools to find something? How many of you have ever been successful in finding what you're looking for? Once, twice maybe, three times? Yeah, you let it run for half an hour and then it comes up with like a bunch of files that have nothing to do with your after. after. Um, it's actually gotten a lot better than it used to be. Uh, we used to actually install tools just to search. Uh, Unix and Linux-like environments have had them since the beginning. The command to you know, find files is called find. Uh, there's tools to search inside the file, so you can actually do a find and then pass it through another tool that actually searches the contents of all the files. So it gets much quicker. Um, basically put the few things that are on here. The load up the dashboard says terminal or control alt T. That's stuff that you see in lab one. As long as you remember those, you're good. Okay, now when you go to shut down Linux, you know, you guys have learned how to load Linux and you've done the shutdown using the little icon. From the command line, there's, there's a few different ways of doing this. Uh, there's a command called shutdown. And apparently in Ubuntu 18, it's called, called power off. It takes the same command line arguments. Why did they rename it? I have no idea, but they decided to rename it. But what's really cool is some students actually had the shutdown command, some had the power off command. They're both running Ubuntu 18, and I don't know why. But uh, shutdown or power off both do the same thing. Uh, shutdown dash R means reboot. When you tell it now, it means do it now. Um, although you can tell it, you know, delay 10 minutes and it'll actually send a message to everybody who's logged into it, say it's going to shut down in 10 minutes. Uh, dash eights means shut down and turn it off. Halt. Uh, halt's a cool thing. It actually sends a, a command to the BIOS and it actually tells the computer to turn itself off. So if you ever wonder when you go Windows shutdown and then the computer turns itself off, the computer needs to know it needs to turn itself off. So Linux you actually get to type in the command to make it do it if you want. Um, in the GUI, you can go system shutdown restart, or in Ubuntu, you've got an icon in the corner. you got your choice of how you do the shutdown. All right. What is a shell? A shell is a command interpreter that executes command. That's its purpose in life. Um, in Windows, you've got the choice of the command prompt and PowerShell. And later versions of Windows ship with PowerShell turned on by default and command prompt pushed to the background because PowerShell is more powerful. Uh, it is. It's just you have to really know what you're doing to actually accomplish anything. Um, however, in Linux, the command shells, the command interpreters are really powerful. They, they're insane. Um, they have their own built-in programming languages. So Bash has its own language called Bash. Uh, there's C shell, which, guess what? The scripts are written in C. And there's ZSH, which I don't remember what the scripting language is. There's uh, R shell, which uses a language called Rex. They have full programming languages built into the shells so that, you know how we have batch files where you could, you know, prompt for a thing and then you go to a label and launch something? Maybe you learned how to do a batch file a little bit. Um, 
with Bash, you can do math, you can execute programs, uh, you can capture the output of the programs and do stuff to it and then return the results to the user. Um, it's actually really powerful. Uh, shells can be interactive or non-interactive. Interactive, you can type. So you type in your commands, stuff happens. You can do non-interactive where you can choose to run a, a file that has the commands in it. It reads the commands from the file. In DOS, or with the command prompt, you guys know those as batch files. On Linux, they're known as shell scripts. The commands are all self-contained. You run it, stuff happens. We're almost done. I'm just trying to power through so I can let everybody run away. Except for those that have lab in an hour. <laughs> um, Bash. What is Bash? Bash is an acronym for Born Again Shell. There used to be a shell originally called the Born Shell, SH. And then somebody decided, hey, that was on Unix. That's where you know, SH came from, the Born Shell. But they needed to port it to Linux. And while they were at it, they added a big pile of features to it. And they decided to call it Bash. Now, when I say they ported it to Linux and added stuff, it's more that they ported it to other operating systems and then added stuff and then they brought it to Linux. Um, Bash was first released in 1989. And it has pretty much not changed since. So you know when you guys open up your terminal in Ubuntu? You're typing in your commands. You're typing in commands in a shell that was created in 1989. And it's just been recompiled to keep running with the modern operating systems. Why? Because it did uh, pretty much everything it needed back then. Uh, it was written in C. So, you know, C actually writes programs. Uh, it's a GPL. That means anybody can take it, change it, and do whatever they want to it. And it was written by a guy called Brian Fox for whatever reason you might want to know that. Now, there's a few commands you can play with inside your machine. Um, I'm actually going to run one of these commands if I can get the... Gonna take a second. Okay, it's really tiny on there. Holy crap, that's small. I can't even read it. It'll be good in the recording, though. <laughs> um, now, some of you, the very front row can read it. Everybody else can't. Um, I ran that command up there, the cat shells, and it shows... SH, dash, bash, and R bash. So by default, Ubuntu's got four shells installed, then you can choose whichever one you want to run. SH runs the old style Linux shell commands. So if ever you need to have really old shell scripts, that's what you want to run them in. Everything else will run in bash. And there's other commands you can run. Echo shell, it tells you what shell you're running right now. There's a bunch of environment variables you can play with. Now, shell built-ins. Now, every shell has certain built-in commands. Non-built-in commands are commands you'd run, like find or vi. Those are utilities and or applications, but it has built-in commands. Each shell has its own built-in commands. When you execute something that's built-in, it doesn't launch a new process. It runs inside itself. Uh, for example, in bash, there's one called help. which obviously it looks like total noise past you know the first two inches away from the screen, but it shows you all the commands that are built into Bash. Next week I'll be using a terminal emulator that has really big fonts so you guys can see better. 
I f normally this is not the room I do the lecture for Linux in. I usually am in one of the ones in C building, you know, the big lecture halls. And the screen's really, really, really big. So then the text is really, really big, not whatever the heck this room's got going. Um, okay. Now, I had to do this for two people it's already. I'm not even going to bother go through this. But this is the instructions on how to recover your root password if ever you lose your root password. Or you lose access to your machine because you have no idea how to get into your machine. Um, this is to show you how easy it is to bypass the security on any operating system. In Linux, you want to change your root password. I remember doing it for a little lady that was sitting right here a few, uh, about 20 minutes ago. Uh, it took me three minutes to change her root password because I couldn't remember what the commands were. Did you have a question? I saw your hand going. Essentially, if you have hardware access, there's no way to bypass, there's no way to secure your machine. So make your password as secure as you want, make it as easy as you want, because if I can get at your machine, I can change your password. And so can any of you, because there's the instructions on how to do it. And there's actually screenshots that show you how to do it. Okay, but there's some basic useful commands for Linux that everybody should know. Passwd, how to change your password. In case you don't know who you are today, you can ask it, who am I? That sounds like a stupid question to ask, but since Linux is a multi-user operating system and when you're a root, you can become someone else, a command called su, as in switch user, if ever you wonder what SU stood for, you know, there's sudo. Sudo means pretend to be this user for this command. SU lets you become that user. And as far as the computer is concerned, you literally are that person. I could say, you know, SU become the guy with the Chromebook, and now I'm him. There's two of us in the room at the same time. And you guys can't tell the difference at all. I can't tell the difference unless I ask, who am I again? Chromebook guy. I'll know your name eventually. I suck at names. Terrible. I won't rem I remember almost no one's names. It's an ongoing joke every term on how many names I'm going to remember by the end of the term. It's usually about six. Uh, who am I allows you to find out who you are. So if you're working as an administrator, you're jumping through user accounts, you may not remember who you are at that point in time. So you can run who am I, and it tells you who you are. Funny thing is, other operating systems, such as Windows, actually has a who am I command built into it too, and so does Novell way back in the day. You could ask Novell, who am I? And it would tell you who you are. Um, you want to know what computer running on? Command called hostname. You type in hostname, it tells you what your computer's called. Uh, why is that important? Uh, sometimes you need to know what your computer is called so you can tell other people how to connect to you. Uh, Uname tells you what operating system you're running. Those of you that have done Lab 1 have already run the first Uname command. It just shows that you're actually running, are running Ubuntu. And switch users, which is SU. I already mentioned that one on the way by. PWD. <coughs> now, this is where things get important. And Lab 1 teaches you all this stuff. PWD is present working directory. Sometimes you don't know where you are in the file system. PWD tells you exactly where you are inside the file system. One of the most important commands because Unix-like file systems are stupid. I'll say it right now. Because there is a... bin directory. There is a user bin directory. There is a user share bin directory. And then there's a bunch of other bin directories. Depending on how your prompt is set up, you might only ever see that you're in bin. How do you know which bin you're in? You don't, unless you ask it, what's my present working directory? Where am I? Not only can it tell you who you are, it can tell you where you are. Um, MKDIR. Um, unless you create a directory. I mean, that goes without saying. It, unless you create a directory, what else is there to say to it? Um, however, it's got a cool little uh, parameter called dash p, which allows you to create a, a whole tree. So let's say you know you need to create multiple subdirectories, 
But first, you know, you'd have a parent directory, and then you have a child directory, and then a directory further down that. You can define the entire path and tell the dash p it'll create all the directories at once. So having to, instead of going, you know, make directory test, cd test, make directory test one, cd test one, make directory test two, I could go make dir dash p test slash test one slash test two. Way faster than trying to do it through the GUI because you can do it in one command. LS. Now, in Computer Essentials, you opened up a command prompt, right? You typed in probably DIR. Does that ring a bell? Directory? Uh, LS does the same thing. It lets you see the contents of the directory. And you can choose what you output, which is going to be completely not clear. Oh, there's nothing there. Okay, let me go. Uh, all right, so I got a bunch of files here. Can't even see them outside of this, but anyways. A bunch of files. That's straight up Alice. It just says list files. LS-L says long, for long listing. It shows you permissions, who owns it, well, how big it is, last time they was touched, that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a bunch of other ones you can use. Uh, A lists all files. It'll show you hidden files also. Uh, in Linux, you'll discover files that start with dot. So, for example, in Windows, you know how you create a file and you go file.txt? It's a text file. In Linux, if I went just dot txt, it'd create a hidden file called txt. It's hidden from the shell unless you ask it to show it to you. So A shows all. And D shows you the parent directory, or the current directory. Uh, CD command, same as it is on Windows. CD, space, change directory. Give it a path, away it goes. Uh, however, there's a few cool tricks. Uh, you can just go cd enter. It'll bring you back to your home directory. You can also go with cd tilde. Uh, for those of you that do not know where the tilde key is on your computer, it is above the tab key, under the escape key, unless you've got a Mac. I'm not sure where the hell the tilde is. Is it the same spot? Yeah, it's the shift in Windows 2. Uh, otherwise, it's a back tick. But it's the same spot. So... The first key under the escape key on the left is your tilde key. And it does the exact same job. If you did CD enter or CD space tilde, it does the exact same thing. It brings you home. Can you imagine? No matter where you are in the world, you just say, take me home, and it just takes you home right away, instantly. Just teleport home. Okay. We had MKDIR, make a directory. There's also RMDIR. It removes empty directories. And only if they are empty. Therefore, if you try to delete a folder or directory that does not that still has files in it, IMDIR will tell you you're a tool and you can't do this. And you won't use those exact words, but it's pretty darn close. Um, and you can remove an entire tree structure by RMDIR-P, which allows you to nuke the child and the parent at once. So you can wipe out the entire family as long as they're all empty on the inside. Uh, another called command called more. Uh, more lets you list the contents of a file one screenful at a time. So I could take, actually, since I was playing with ls a second ago. So there's ls-al. You just saw a thing go, I'm pretend I'm a hacker in a TV show and you know, shit's flying across the screen, right? But I actually want it to be useful. So now I can make it go one page at a time. And as you can see, I don't know how many of you heard how many keystrokes that was, but one, two, three, four, five, six screens worth of stuff, as opposed to that was six screens worth of stuff that you never saw go by. Um, more is great. Uh, it's actually got a lot of functionality that they don't really touch up in this class. You can search through a file using more. 
Um, there are commands for searching using more. You load up a file called more and you go slash and give it a string and whoop, it searches for you. Okay, if you're trying to find documentation how to do stuff, there's a command called man. As in manual. RTFM? Anybody ever hear that acronym? Read the manual? I'm not even going to say it because I don't want to have to go remember to go censor it out of my recording. But re read the friggin' manual. Let's go with that. But there's a command on Linux called man. Oh, that's cool. Now I'm just going to skip through because obviously you guys can't read it because it's so small. But that, that six pages worth of text was the instruction on how to use the word, the command ls. So six pages of information on ls. If you don't know how to use a command, there's help for that. It's under man. It's in the manual. It's way better than saying it's in the textbook. Um, there's also a command called info. It's usually less formal than man. Man files have a very specific format that the people who create the files have to follow. The info often is less formal, as in people just throw stuff in there whichever way they want. Often it looks just like the man file because, you know, we created good documentation for the man file. Why would I make a stupid version? But sometimes people just create the info file and skip the man file. So sometimes you don't find the instructions in one, but you'll find it in the other. So as you can see, the, the syntax is written up differently. It has more words, clearer English explanation, because it's information, not the manual. All right, now this is the one that kills everyone. And that's how we're actually almost at the end of the slideshow now. The absolute path versus the relative path. This is something most Windows users never take into account. It's where are you in the file system? Now, an absolute path is like giving your full address to where you are. However, it's more going around, the, you're giving your full address, but you're starting out with, okay, Earth, North America, Canada, Ontario, Ottawa, wherever the hell we are, Nepean, Algonquin College, T building, first floor, T119, front of the class, right? That's an absolute path because I told you where I am right from the outside in. A relative path is I'm at the front of T119. Yeah, you guys know where I am because you're in here with me. But do you know where you are in relation to everything else in the world? No, that's a rel relative path. That's a pretty extreme example, what I'm using. But it's sort of like saying... Um, if we just kept it simple, talk about you're at Algonquin College is the root, you're in T building, you're on the first floor in T119. That would be an absolute path. But if I say you're in T119, that's a relative path. You don't really know where you are. So if you are working in this room and I say, okay, now you got to go to the back of the room, well, you're working relatively, so that means you assume that you mean the back of this room. If you're working with an absolute path, I'd say you got to work from you must all move to the back of the Algonquin T building first floor T119 room. So, yes. So let's say, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, how many of you in Windows have lost files? Because you don't know where it was, right? Because you were working relative. As then you drop the file wherever, and I go, I remember where that is, no problem. Because you never took the time to actually understand where it was. In Linux, when I start talking about paths that look like this, where you drop the file in the bin folder and you didn't pay attention to what the absolute path was, you might be in one of three separate bin folders. Then you've got to go try to find the damn thing. Um, the cool part is, is no matter where you are, in the file system. Let's say I'm in this bin folder and I want to copy a file from this bin folder to that bin folder. If I just go slash bin, it always will go to slash bin. It'll go, OK, 
Okay, starting right at the base root, we're going to move something there. Congratulations. So that's the absolute path, as in you're always giving the full address of where things are supposed to be. Um, the tilde is always the absolute path of the user's home directory. So if you're a user and you feed in tilde, it always uses an absolute path. As opposed to if you just go cd, it goes to the relative path for your user. Tilde goes to the absolute path, even though it's the same effect in the end. Um, so the good news is absolute paths work no matter where you are. On the other hand, relative paths mean anything from where you are right now in relation to it. So if I said, okay, we are in T building and I need you to move to the first floor, you assume that the first floor is below in, or is inside T building. If I tell you, well, we got to go up, one, we got to go one layer out of T building, which means we're at Algonquin, we, we know we moved up one. Do we know absolutely where we are? No, we just know we're somewhere in, Al in Algonquin now. Um, but we don't, but it, because you moved relatively to where you are. <coughs> it's as if I told one of you guys, okay, you're going to move out to the hall because you're going to go down one level from where you're at. Honestly, you don't know where you are compared to the rest of the structure. You just know you're now moved out one. So that's a relative path. It's always relative to whatever you're doing currently. In other words, wherever you are now, if you feed it a path and you don't start it with a slash, you're working relative to where you are. In other words, you're using your current coordinates and you're moving left, right, up and down from there. Whereas if you're using a full path, you always start with a complete address. So you always know exactly where you're supposed to be. Uh, there's two special operators, dot and dot, dot. Um, in DOS, do you know when you were playing in your command prompt and you went cd dot dot and you went up one directory? Same thing in Linux. cd dot dot brings you up one. Dot means current directory. So you know, this is where I am now. Dot dot means the parent directory. So two examples. If I go make directory test, it means it'll create the directory where I'm at right now. So wherever I am, I'm going to create a directory there. But if I say make directory home user one test, it'll make a test specifically in that location on the file system. So a rel relative path means work wherever I'm at. Absolute means absolutely put it there. So it's a bit like when you tell your kids or your SOs, can you put that in the garbage? I don't know if you've ever had this experience. You tell them to put it in the garbage and they put it in the closest garbage. So they got an old banana peel and they throw it in the garbage can in the bathroom. Then next day you smell the rotten banana smell. When you go to the bathroom, you go, bathroom's supposed to stink, but not that smell. Because you didn't tell them specifically where to put it. You gave them a relative path, throw it in the garbage can, as opposed to throw it in the kitchen garbage can, which is an absolute path. So once again, relative path is open to interpretation based on where you are. Absolute path leaves no guessing. And there's some examples of what these things are. And that's, I think if I remember, this is the last slide. Um, so slash is the root folder under slash. You got bin, s, bin, dev, etc, home, mount, and a bunch of other things. And if you're sitting in user one, that's your relative path. That means dot, dot means home. Lab is below it. So if I was sitting in dev, I can't go cd lab one because I'm not in the path, but I could go cd slash home slash user one slash lab one. So yeah, this is the big difference between relative and not. Depending on where you are, you may not be able to jump where you want to go unless you give it the full absolute path. And that was the last slide. Hot damn. Okay. Now, for this week, do the final announcements. For this week, you need to finish setting up your Linux environment. Those of you who had lab yesterday, congratulations, you're done. Those of you that got lab tonight, congratulations, you'll be done by, whatever, 9.30. Uh, I am, as soon as I'm done here, we'll be going to the classroom if it's open. I don't know if there's somebody in there ahead of us. Uh, if it goes well and there's no one ahead, ahead of us in there, we could all go early and leave early, which is even better. 
if you're willing to go. I'm going to stick around for the whole time because I have to, but, you know. Um, and then uh, you should start looking at the hybrids. Not necessarily this week, but soon. Um, next week's lab is basically based on paths and creating directories. So basically the last three or four slides of the slideshow is what next week's lab is based on. Um, I intend to try to have a CSI up by the end of the week or the start of next week. But as I said, my, my Brightspace is set up, but basically every week is your syllabus, your, uh, I mean your CSI. It shows you exactly when everything is and when things are due. So if you look at the calendar for the course, it actually shows you the due dates for all the labs. So you actually know when everything's due anyways. Uh, other than that, um, I'll try to have the recording up by tomorrow. I usually do. And uh, I'll see you guys either in lab or see you next week. Okay, I'll try to remember that. Okay. Really No.